Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 795 for December 1st, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. There's very few buildings that want to be beautiful anymore. You don't build many churches, schools, uh, libraries, all of these public buildings. Being beautiful isn't part of the brief anymore. But a distillery, for some reason it is. It's one of the most beautiful building types there is. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you picture a Scotch whiskey distillery? If you're like most people, you think of a pagoda. Distilleries didn't always have pagodas until the architect Charles Doig came up with the idea of putting them on the tops of the chimneys for malt kilns as a way to diffuse the smoke while allowing airflow. Doig designed 56 different distilleries during his lifetime, and his trademark pagoda is still used as a design element in some modern distilleries, even though there's no malt kiln or chimney. Gareth Roberts is one of the modern-day successors to Charles Doig's legacy, along with William Delmay Evans and other architects of Whiskey's past. Roberts is one of the principals in Organic Architects and has completed four distillery projects so far, with nearly two dozen more in the works. We'll talk with Gareth Roberts in a few minutes on Whiskey Cast in Depth. We'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, December's Whiskey Club of the Month winner, and on Behind the Label, we'll get the answers to some of your whiskey questions. It's all ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey, and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the war comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's start with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. The International Wine and Spirit Competition handed out its 2019 trophies and medals Thursday night in London. William Grant & Sons claimed top honors as the Outstanding Spirits producer, while the Balvenies' David Stewart was honored for outstanding achievement in the Scotch whiskey industry. Wyden Mackay was named the Scotch Whiskey Producer of the Year, while Irish Distillers won the award for Worldwide Whiskey Producer of the Year. In the Whiskey Awards, Ben Riach, aged 35 years old, won the trophy for single malt scotches 26 years and over. Glenn Fittick, 21, for single malts 16 to 25 years old, and Royal Brackla, 12 years old, for single malts 15 years and under. Aberlauer Abuna won for cask strength single malts, and Glen Goyne's Pedro Jimenez cask finish won for single malt scotch whiskies with no age statement. Grant's 12-year-old won the blended scotch whiskey trophy, while Redbreast 12 won the worldwide whiskey trophy, and Eagle Rare 10-year-old won the bourbon trophy. We have a link to the complete list of trophy and medal winners at the WhiskeyCast website. Meanwhile, the Spirit of Speyside Festival has picked the eight finalists for its 2020 Whiskey Awards. Judges picked two whiskeys in each category. In the 12 years and under category, Aberlauer 10 and Cardew 12 will face off. Ben Romick, 15, and the Glenallachy, 15, will compete in the 13 to 20 years old category. In the 21 years and over competition, it'll be the Glenfiddich Grand Cru and Glenfarclas, 25. While Tam Navul and Sherry Cask and Cardew Amber Rock will compete for the No Age Statement title. The winners will be determined at a series of public tastings around the world between now and the festival, along with tastings during the Spirit of Speyside Festival. It runs from April 29th through May 4th. I mentioned the Balvenies' David Stewart a minute ago. 
His latest release came out this week, the second in the marriage series of 50-year-old Balvenies. This year's edition takes whiskey from the same four casks that were used for last year's debut release and blends in one more cask of vintage Balvenie. It'll be available in, as you might expect, very limited amounts worldwide. The U.S. recommended retail price, $38,000 each. Now that is still a lot less than an Aston Martin would cost you, but you'll soon be able to buy an Aston Martin branded Beaumore. The automaker was able to get a trademark for its name in the whiskey category and immediately announced a tie-up with Beam Suntory this week. The two will team up to create a series of exclusive bottlings and experiences. No word yet on when the first whiskey will be released. Inner Mongolia is not widely known as a hotbed for whiskey yet, but that could be changing. The BBC reports that a Scottish company has been hired to build a whiskey distillery in the Chinese region. Valentine International won a contract from Mengtai Group to serve as project manager for the distillery, with all of the equipment to be built in Scotland and assembled in Mongolia by Scottish engineers. Mengtai Group is primarily involved in the energy sector. This is the second major distillery project announced so far in China this year. Pernod Ricard is building a $150 million malt whiskey distillery in Sichuan province. It's scheduled to open in 2021. Back in September, we toured Australia's Starward Distillery in Melbourne during episode 782. Now, Starward has announced plans for a major expansion at its distillery in Port Melbourne. The project will start after the holidays and is expected to significantly increase production capacity. That move comes as Starward CEO Andrew McDonald is stepping down. He's being replaced by former Treasury Wine Estates Chief Marketing Officer Simon Martin. Diageo owns a minority stake in Starward through its Distill Ventures Venture Capital Unit. In other news, White & Mackay is releasing two new editions in its Jura Rare Vintage series. The 1989 edition is matured exclusively in ex-bourbon barrels, while the 1988 Mark II release is a successor to last year's debut release of the 1988 edition. It started out in ex-bourbon barrels with the last five years in port pipes. Only 1,500 bottles of each edition will be available at a recommended retail price of 650 pounds each. The 1989 version will be available at whiskey shops globally and Asian travel retail outlets, while the new 1988 edition will only be available at whiskey shops in Asia. Ireland's Teeling Whiskey Company is kicking off a new Renaissance series of single malts. The first one is an 18-year-old that's finished in Madeira wine casks. It'll be available only in Ireland until after the holidays at a price of 140 euros a bottle. There'll be wider availability in Europe and Asia during 2020. Saturday was St. Andrew's Day in Scotland, and the Eden Mill Distillery in St. Andrew's released its 2019 single malt whiskey this weekend to celebrate the holiday. It's the third single malt release for Eden Mill and features art from local artist Hilke McIntyre on the packaging. It'll sell for £79 a bottle through the distillery shop. And Glen Goyne is releasing the latest edition of its teapot dram, that one's named in honor of the distillery's teapot that was used back in the day to give the night crew a little something stronger than tea during their shift. It's matured exclusively in First Fill European Oak Oloroso Sherry Casks, and it's bottled at cask strength. It's only sold at the distillery and through the Glen Goyne website for £120 a bottle. And finally, I'm allergic to shellfish but not news about shellfish, or in this case, oysters. We've reported before about Glenmorangie's work to help restore the oyster reefs in the Cromarty Firth near the distillery in Scotland. Now, Moat Hennessy USA, which is Glenmorangie's U.S. importer, is expanding that work. 
It's partnering with the Billion Oyster Project to help restore the oyster reefs in New York Harbor. The group has already restored seven acres of oyster reefs over the last five years, with approximately 30 million oysters so far. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent John E. Fitzgerald was patrolling the rickhouses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but also for himself. You see, Mr. Fitzgerald was stealing a taste of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side. Today's award-winning Larceny Bourbon has that same soft, smooth character Fitzgerald loved. Look for Larceny Bourbon at 92 Proof at your local retailer and be on the lookout for the upcoming limited edition releases of Larceny Barrel Proof. You can always find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely. Drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. Lots going on this week in New York City around Whiskey Fest on Tuesday night. Check our calendar at the Whiskey Cast website for the most updated details on tastings and master classes around the city. Michael Veach's Bourbon Salon will have its annual Repeal Day celebration Thursday night at Oxmoor Farm in Louisville. Buffalo Trace Distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky has its annual Lighting of the Trace holiday event that same night, while Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore, Maryland will turn on the holiday lights Friday night, and Maker's Mark Distillery hosts the first of its two holiday open house events on Saturday night in Loretto, Kentucky. Dublin's Teeling Whiskey Company hosts the annual Spirit of Dublin Craft Fair on Sunday the 8th. The Whiskey Extravaganza wraps up its 2019 schedule on the 12th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Robin Robinson hosts one of his Whiskey Smackdown tastings, pitting scotches against bourbons on December 14th at the Astor Center in New York City. And the Lakes Distillery in Setmerthy, England, will have its 5th anniversary celebration on the 14th as well. Right now, we have 215 different events around the world through the end of 2020 on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you're planning a trip next year, check the calendar first. You might just find a whiskey event that you can add to your travel plans. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind word of something new a whiskey from the land of always winter for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking winter is here white walker by johnny walker white walker by johnny walker blended scotch whiskey 41.7 percent alcohol by volume imported by diageo north america norwalk connecticut please drink responsibly Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. The global boom in whiskey has created a boom for those who design and build distilleries. While many of the older distilleries around Scotland share similar design styles, popularized by architects like Charles Doig and William Delmay Evans, today's architects are giving their projects a more contemporary design to carry them through Scotch whiskey's next century. Of course, it's impossible to talk about whiskey and modern-day architecture without discussing the McAllen's massive new distillery designed by Rogers, Stirk, Harbor, and Partners. It's not only been seen as a landmark in whiskey, but the project was a finalist for the 2019 Sterling Prize that's presented by the Royal Institute of British Architects to the UK's Best New Building. Now, the McAllen Project was one where money was no object, or at least not much of one. Gareth Roberts works on a much smaller scale, though. He and his partners at Organic Architects in Helensboro, Scotland, have completed four distilleries so far. Arden American, Lindora Sabby, Dartmoor, and the small Nicknean Distillery 
on the Isle of Mull. They have more than 20 other distillery projects on the drawing board right now and have become one of the go-to architects in Scotland, not only for designing distilleries, but serving as project managers for the construction process. I talked with Gareth Roberts this week. Let's start at the beginning here. How did you guys wind up getting into distillery design and construction and architecture? Sure, sure. Well, um, I'm an architect. Um, I have been uh, an architect for about 25 years. I've worked in the UK and I've worked abroad. I spent a time. I studied in Switzerland. I worked in Moscow in Russia for a while on house building. Um, And I wound up about uh, 15 years ago actually leaving architecture and going to work for a house builder. And in the UK, house builders do uh, very large sites, deliver hundreds of houses. So it's a very systematized industry. So um, what I was doing for them was everything from buying sites, organizing very complex teams of consultants, of um, in engineers and, and so on, um, all the way through to delivering houses uh, and handing people the keys. So when we got the opportunity as a new architecture practice to um, bid for a, a competition for a distillery, um, we went in with the attitude of being an architect plus. So we went to the, the first one that we ever had the opportunity to work on was Adelphi for uh, the Ardenmerkin Distillery for Adelphi. Um, and we really said to them, look, we, we'll, we'll build you this distillery. We'll deliver it. And I went in with a builder uh, who sat next to me in the, in the competition bid. And I said, this is the guy that will build it. Uh, I gave them a model of what it would look like. And I gave them a cost plan and said, we'll do everything for you. So it was a really strong bid. And we, we won that job. Um, we were already working for the directors of the business uh, doing um, biomass uh, work for other um, other buildings. So Ardner Merkin was one of the first biomass, successful biomass powered distilleries and it's really quite lauded as one of the greenest distilleries there is. Um, so that's that was the starting point for us and from then on because it, it looked so seductive, because it was a really attractive design in a very beautiful place. Um, it kind of sounds like a cliche, but the phones never really stopped ringing. Um, so after that, after Art Merkin was completed in 2014, I think, um, we then did uh, very close. We went to Drimnin Distillery, which is Nipnean. And then after that, we had the opportunity to work on uh, Lindor's Abbey Distillery, uh, which worked out really well. So that's an absolutely beautiful distillery. And the link with many of these projects was uh, Dr. Jim Swan, who was um, uh, just an amazing uh, head and an amazing brain and uh, obviously worked on Cavalan and many of these distilleries. Oh, but yeah. Jim and I used to work together. Yeah. So, you know, you know, Jim's reputation. Um, so uh, we used to work together. And really, if, if I got an opportunity, I would bring it to Jim. And if Jim got an opportunity, he would bring it to me. So for about five years, we wandered around the world together, sort of um, building new distilleries. Um, so um, after that, um, we we are now working on a whole new range of distilleries, which are on the drawing board. Um, we've just put in a, a planning application for a small uh, distillery in the borders, uh, which is which is really beautiful. That's uh, Moffat Distillery, and that's for... Um, a, a guy who's uh, Nick Bullard Hurrett, who is a blender. He's got a blending background. Um, so that's the emphasis of that. Um, but um, yeah, so there's a lot of um, legacy uh, work going on with community groups and people who uh, understand that a distillery is going to be there for many decades, many centuries perhaps, and that if you can get over the cash flow headaches of starting a distillery, it's got a legacy income for the community and it gives legacy jobs in a place where there are no jobs and it gives interest to visitors in a place where there's nothing else to see apart from scenery. Um, so it's such a valuable thing, I think, for rural areas, but also for um, uh, any, anywhere that you put it. I think it adds character to a place. Tell me what you learned about whiskey from Jim Swan. 
when it came to designing mm-hmm. distilleries because uh, Jim had his own uh, unique methods that he left behind in a few notes for his clients, but took most of them with him when he passed. What did Jim teach you yeah. about making whiskey? Well, uh, what I learned was, okay, I'm an architect. Uh, he, he told me how you service a building. And he used to joke a little that every one of my buildings was uh, a courtyard, but I'm sure I learned that from him. You need to access every single side of a building to make it uh, an efficient plant because at the end of the day, we're making beautiful buildings. And I always say to people, we're really lucky. There's very few buildings that want to be beautiful anymore. You don't build many churches, schools, uh, libraries, all of these public buildings. Being beautiful isn't part of the brief anymore. But a distillery, for some reason it is. It's one of the most beautiful building types there is. So um, we're we're often building in very beautiful places. So Jim told me how to service these and to to lay them out so that they were efficient, efficient production machines. But also I learned a lot about the chemistry side of things because that was his expertise. And the length of line arms <laughs> and the 400 characteristics that flavor characteristics that come from um, from the the copper and how long it takes to season stills and all these chemical aspects you know the production aspects um, it's great to be able to have some knowledge of that when I'm speaking to a new distiller um, to be able to bring that into the architecture as well I mean one of the the, the craziest jobs that we worked on was um, we did a, a job in China, very, very high elevation in China. And um, we weren't sure whether the water was going to, uh, water there was going to boil 80 something degrees. It, it, it wasn't going to make steam at uh, 100 degrees. Um, we were concerned that the stills in, in that elevation weren't going to um, give all of their uh, complex flavors into the spirit. So what we did was we designed the still room uh, so that it could be effectively dropped down to sea level. And the way that we did that was by making a big steel box. We pressurized the still room. Um, and so that uh, when when they finally get up and running, uh, if the stills work at 80 something degrees, that's fantastic. You know, the, the distillate will be good, but maybe it won't be. So they have the opportunity there. They have the insurance policy to be able to bring the thing down to effectively down to sea level uh, by pressurizing and automating the still room. So that that's a sort of complex challenge. I mean, there, there was also lots of other technical things. Looking at barley and working with uh, maltings suppliers, um, particularly that overseas one as well, bringing things back to the UK and doing testing and doing micro distilling. Uh, and looking at the chemical side of things and whether you know, traditional po- uh, ways of distilling um, in China, for example, uh, they, they, they make uh, baijiu, you probably know, which is mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the world's most popular spirit. Um, and so you would think, well, okay, you're making barley spirit. It must be similar to make whiskey. All you do is take barley spirit and lay it down. But actually, no, you can't possibly. It, it's a very different type of barley. So you need to mix that. And I think Jim's solution was to mix it with rice, some form of rice to give it body so that you could actually mash it. So you're going into these sorts of very complex problem-solving exercises, really outside what an architect does. Um, But uh, part of that whole uh, idea of just delivering, finding a problem, solving the problem and delivering something to, to the distiller. Uh, which is just fascinating. It's always nice to be given a challenge. So yeah, we miss Jim greatly, but uh, we learned a lot. And uh, and the other aspect of Jim was just on a professional side. He was the world's most professional man. <laughs> he really was. Oh, yeah. And everyone appreciated that so much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, delight to work with him, yeah. When we think of whiskey and architecture, the name Charles Doig always comes to mind. Yeah, because of all yeah, the distilleries yeah, he did a hundred years ago mm. around Scotland. Yeah, when you're yeah. talking with a client, how closely do you want to hew to that sort of traditional distillery style that Doig left behind around Scotland mm. uh, with the pagodas and the sloping roofs and things like that? Yeah, 
when we don't need those pagodas anymore because those were the tops of the chimneys for the kilns, no. which most distilleries don't use anymore. No, no, you're quite right. But how do you balance tradition with modern design? Yeah, that's a really good question. It depends very much on the approach of the distiller, whether they have a traditional mindset, and that links you to thinking about the entire building. Uh, the building should reflect the brand, and some brands want to be traditional, but other brands really don't want to be traditional. They want to be very contemporary. So we have designed fake pagodas, if you like, um, for some distilleries to typify what it is that you're driving past. But other distilleries, I think of Lindor's, for example, Lindor's Abbey, there's no pagoda there um, because other distillers say, well, look, that's a bit, it's a bit false. It's a bit twee. It's not something that we want to do. Um, having said that, when you go through Speyside and you go to a, a, a Doig pagoda distillery, it's just magical. It really is. But it's not contemporary. So sometimes we still have people coming to us saying, it's going to be a pagoda. It's going to have this traditional look with contemporary elements. But other people want something uh, which are perhaps less visitor focused. Um, we did a job for a farmer, for example. He just wanted to make spirit. He wasn't going to have any visitors. And so that was a steel box and half of it's outside because you need huge amounts of ventilation and you've got to get rid of a lot of heat um, for a distillery. So uh, you, you can put things outside. You don't have to have everything internally. And so long as you keep the birds out, really, that's all you need to do. Um, and even when you do build a new distillery, you've got to get lots of ventilation. When it's a cold spell, it can be a horrible, challenging place to work in a distillery. Um, the doors are open, you know, no matter how cold. So, um, yeah, I think uh, some, some people want the doig look. Um, it's great to see the old buildings. We just want to make beautiful and efficient buildings. So if that's what somebody wants, that's fine by me. But equally, if, if they want something more contemporary, um, we're there to, to give the client what they want at the end of the day or what the brand requires at the end of the day. Um, and, and equally, as I say, we're looking at existing um, distilleries and putting visitor centers onto them. Some of them are really huge, big industrial plants with grain and different types of stills, Loman stills, pot stills, column stills. They don't want to hide that fact. They don't want to be twee and put pagodas everywhere because they were never designed with that. What these guys want is to be genuine to what they are, which is industrial plants. But they've got to make sure that their visitors don't clash with the equipment, the forklift trucks and everything else on the site. So um, we're very often looking at segregated routes for people, uh, safe routes for people, um, and then opening up things where, say, for example, if a distillery's got a cooperage, uh, that's something that for a visitor is an amazing thing to see. To them, it's just an industrial process. But it's such a valuable thing for a visitor to be able to see. It's really fascinating handwork hard hand work. So um, we'll be opening up to allow them to do that. And the distiller, you know, probably doesn't even consider that that's something that's worth watching. But the visitor manager certainly knows that it's, it's, it's a great experience. So I think there's a lot of heritage that you can exploit and explain. And it doesn't all just need to be the ultra -trad traditional, uh, like the way it's always been. Essentially, you are working with a chemical plant here that uh, yeah, in the exactly. old days was never designed for anybody to visit, and no. yet you have more than a million people visiting distilleries in Scotland and nearly as many visiting distilleries yeah. in Ireland and all over the world. Yeah. And I have to imagine the health and safety guys are going nuts over this, but uh, how do you design a facility both from the ground up and going into an existing facility to balance access for visitors with the safety factor. Yeah, yeah. Well, th the advantage is that even a medium-sized distiller is really quite a small process, uh, a minor process. You don't have that many 
operatives in a distillery. So it's quite a safe place to go. Um, I know of one distiller that used to uh, give people a dram at the beginning of the tour, and they've had to stop because you can't have drunk people going around a distillery anymore. You, you have to give people the dram at the end rather than at the beginning, you know. So the things are evolving. A few of the different jobs we've done, we've actually put walkways through, dedicated walkways. The way that the old distilleries were, they weren't just not set up for visitors. Where they've got viewing platforms, they might not have been for viewing, so they don't give very good views. So we've been uh, putting in segregated walkways and that sort of thing. And and also, it depends where you are. Um, For example, I mean, to go back to China, the Chinese character in the distillery we designed there, they just wanted a big straight corridor. And I said to them, really, is that good enough for you? And they said, yeah, you know, that's our character. We go around in big groups and we'll follow each other. And it it suits the Chinese mindset. Whereas when we design uh, a distillery in, in maybe in Europe, in Scotland, people want surprise and, well, we use the words surprise and delight, you know, coming around corners and seeing unexpected views and looking at views of the fields beyond, perhaps, Again, thinking about Lindor's, we put the stills right looking over the Abbey ruins where the you know the story of Scotch distilling started. Um, so that there was a link, there was a kind of lyrical link between the new build and the old build. Um, so uh, I think it's it's horses for courses. It's about the character of the people. Um, it is a small scale process, so it's not that difficult to keep people safe. Um, but it is quite surprising when you're going through a distillery and the stills are roaring away, you know. And the, as you'll know, the heat of a still when you're next to it, it's quite frightening. It's, it's sobering how hot a still is. Um, and there's no guardrails around this or anything. So you do need to have people fairly well drilled and fairly well guided and, of course, pretty sober. That always helps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe not by the time they leave, but certainly when they're going around the the scary bits of the distillery. One of the projects you're associated with is the Princeton Distillery on the Duchy of Cornwall. And I should explain that the Duchy of Cornwall is owned by, shall we say, a rather noted um, aficionado and critic of architecture and development in Prince Charles, yes. the heir to the throne. Yes. Yeah. And your plans had to meet with his approval for the community yeah. to build that distillery. That's right. How hard was that knowing what he has said about architecture and development in the past and that he fancies himself as a student of architecture? Well, he's a, a known critic, as you say, of modern architecture, and he's a known lover of whiskey. So he knew that he wanted a distillery. We just knew that it was going to be a traditional distillery. So we played into his hands a little bit. We needed to get his approval for our drawings and you submit everything. And then I think there's an eight month period where you wait for word to come from his office that he he likes what you've done or, or come back and give him the opportunity to comment. So we did some very traditional hand drawn uh, watercolored Uh, images for him to sign off and to be honest because of this eight month cycle of approval we didn't give him too much to uh, to comment on we didn't ask him too many questions so we really gave him a red colored version of a traditional distillery um, a a kind of vanilla colored version of a traditional distillery and a white colored version of a traditional distillery so we only gave him the opportunity to really comment on the color of the thing ultimately he wasn't the problem. We eventually got the approval, but because of who he is, the BBC got involved in the planning application process. You know, and the planning application is the opportunity for the uh, the locals to comment. Oh, well, anyone to comment, uh, and you can go online and say, "I don't like it for this reason and this reason." So the the British tabloid newspapers got involved. Um, I was going to community meetings with hundreds of people there getting very exercised Um, and long story short we got the approval by no means because of who Prince Charles was I think they had to be 
extra diligent to be very careful about giving a, a proper legal approval because Prince Charles was involved. But uh, yeah, he gets his distillery. It's very traditional. Um, but Dartmoor is an amazing place. You know, there's a high security prison up there. And it's very, it, for, for the southwest of England, it's quite elevated. I mean, it's only a thousand feet up, but it's quite a harsh place. Lots of fog and mist and very romantic. Um, so uh, it's a difficult place to build and uh, it's going to be a really amazing place to visit. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a big stone pagoda topped uh, traditional looking building, which is quite befitting of the uh, of the Duchy of Cornwall and Prince Charles. And it's about a stone's throw from his office. So no doubt he'll be there quite a lot, I think. But that was a really great job to be involved with. Yeah. Now, does he have an ownership interest in this other than the land, or is this his no, project? No, he's just just the landowner. It, it, it was um, a businessman took the idea to the Duchy of Cornwall, just like you or I could take the idea. So good for them. Uh, so, uh, no, it's, it's just an entrepreneurial venture, but it happens to be on his land. You brought up the uh, pushback that came from the community. Yeah. How often do you get that when going through the planning process? I know there are distilleries in the works now around Scotland that are having no end of trouble going through planning because of people commenting, saying, we don't really need a distillery here. Why are we doing this? Things like that. Yeah. No, it's a good question. Yeah. I, I can't imagine why anyone would not want it. It's such a beautiful type of building but um people don't like change um half of the jobs that we've done we've had zero complaints and i mean none it's sailed through the system and the other half of the jobs that we've done you know roughly speaking we've had hundreds of complaints that we've had to answer um but we've never failed to get permission and then when they've been built they've never failed to sit fantastically in the landscape and do their quiet job of creating you know great product and great tourist experience and, and, and good income um, so it's the usual thing nobody wants change um, and then it happens to them and they realize actually it's okay after all um, but uh, it's uh, it, it's been it's been hard at times to fight these battles um, but generally, we've always had really good support from the local authorities because they know the truth of the matter is that these things are beneficial. And what else are you going to get in these very far away places? Um, you know, you get salmon farms in Scotland and you get you get whiskey farms. Uh, there's not a lot else you can do in the Highlands. Uh, and and uh, tourism is everything for us. And these are great things, too. Uh, benefit tourism as well which they never were you know distilleries in the 70s and the 60s they built some dreadful looking big boxes they were horrible things because they just didn't think that anyone was going to be interested to visit and we go to some places i remember after we finished art and i went to another distillery down in ayrshire a more uh, kind of industrial distillery and i worked out it was a thousand times bigger production capacity than the distillery had just finished. Um, it's just incredible how much spirit is made <laughs> in, in, in the country. Um, so we're at the micro end of things and they can be really very attractive little buildings. Uh, and that, that I've always said to people is, I think this is like a new wave of craft distilling. It's a new wave, but also very much from a British perspective, um, it seems to me that everywhere used to have food and drink, you know, individual local food and drink. And then uh, I think that with rationing after the, the Second World War, I think we lost all that. Our food and drink became very meat and potatoes. And we're now just coming back, you know, generations later, we're coming back to finding our own individual food and drink. Um, and so uh, lots of the spirits, uh, industries, I think, is just the local places making their own typical uh, pr products again. And that's why I'm such a big believer in terroir and, and, and local quality and local character to, to the product. This is going to be a fun one for you. All right, great. Of all the distilleries you've been to in Scotland, Ireland, and around the world, 
not counting the ones you did. Oh, no. Yeah. Which one is your favorite architecture wise? Not necessarily the whiskey, but in terms of the building, the layout, the design, the way it yeah. fits into the environment. Which one is your favorite? And then which one is the one that if you had your fantasy distillery to knock down and rebuild, which one would that be? Oh, that's easy. That's easy. It's the most beautiful distillery for me. It's beautiful in a strange way, I suppose, because it is industrial. But Dalwini, you know Dalwini, you drive up the A9, you drive through the center of Scotland from the central belt right up to Speyside. And on your left-hand side, as you're going north, there's Dalwini Distillery. And it's, it's traditional. It's got pagoda roofs. It's whitewashed. They've got the beautiful worm tub, big wooden worm tubs on the front of it, which face the road. But the really interesting thing is when you start to look into it in detail, there's two of everything. So there's two warehouses, there's two chimneys, there's two worm tops, there's two pagoda roofs. It's just, I mean, and I'm sure that's intentional in some way that somebody has twinned everything up, but it gives it such a kind of um, harmonious look. Uh, and it's your, one of your ultimate Scottish buildings. Forget distilleries. It's just one of the most beautiful buildings in the country. Um, and then what was your second question? You said, if I could knock one down and start again, what do you mean by that? Well, which one is the ugliest one that just doesn't look the right, that doesn't fit? And the one that you'd like just to, if you had your chance to say, I yeah. could do so much better with this. Well, I, I won't name names, but I know some on Isla where they are just big steel boxes and they're in heaven. They look, the, the view out is absolutely stunning. Um, but the view back to the building from the shore is not so good. And so there are some of these uh, buildings built in the 70s and the 80s. I think I'd love to rebuild them, do them right. Um, ultimately, they function really well as a distillery. And they probably, most of the visitors don't notice. But to do them right, to, to make an amazing branded experience, I don't mean that in a horrible way, but to make a, you know, the, the people who market the product will be doing a really amazing job. And if only the buildings could be as beautiful as the product that they market, that would be the full package, wouldn't it? So, yeah, there are a few, particularly particularly Isla, I think, um, but also some in Speyside, um, where they don't quite match the, the stunning surroundings. Um, but, um, you know, you don't need to try very hard in such beautiful places. Uh, to build beautiful buildings. I'm thinking, going through my checklist mentally of all the Isla distilleries, and I can think of one that fits your description. <laughs> um, yeah. Near the town of Port Esqueg, I think, is the one. Uh, uh, could be. Could be. Could yeah. be. Um, but yeah. uh, all the others look pretty traditional to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the course, most part. There's some, there's some stunning um seaside distilleries up there yeah also it's a little bit disappointing with some of the kind of the new super distilleries that are made um but you know th there's two different attitudes they're, they're production plants they're not always visitor facilities some of them are never expect to see visitors so um yeah they, they do what they do very well and i'll tell you a, a quick uh, anecdote about when we were doing uh Ardnamurkin, which really was one of the first new distilleries um so we were designing that and we sat down with richard forsyth and his team you know the, the stills suppliers and we said to them so have we have we made a an efficient layout here is it an efficient production layout and they said well nobody's really built a distillery since there was a few in the 60s and then it was about 1852 was the last time anyone built a distillery so we just had to suck it and see so we now know whether we're efficient or not but at the time we, we were really guessing whether the plant was laid out well we were concentrating on the way it looked um but luckily uh, yeah we now know how to to make it work well as well and did it work i haven't tasted the oh, yeah. american spirit yet so yeah no the spirit's good yeah um i had some of the first new make that came off the new stills and that was another jim swan uh kind of uh lesson to me i i said to him look jim how long does it take for you to get it right to balance a new whiskey plant uh, you know get the dials set right and the pumps working right and this working and that working and he gave me a look of utter 
like, oh, how stupid are you, Gareth? And he just said, you just turn it on. You design it well and you just turn it on and it makes the spirit. So I think that was maybe a little bit of a simplification of things. But no, once you've got the, uh, your, your heat balance done, then the design is all. And so much of it comes from that initial design. And, you know, with Jim, um, for example, at Lindor's designing uh, two spirit stills, split spirit stills. And that wasn't triple distillation. That's taking the wash um, and and the low wines and then splitting it into the spirit stills and getting more copper contact. So it's that level of detail that we're going into with these new plants, which is much more perhaps than, than the old guys ever did. Uh, so intentionally um, marketing or creating a spirit which has got a kind of character from the outset through the design. This may be a sign of the trend. Gareth Roberts says his firm is getting a lot of inquiries these days from gin distillers in the UK looking to add a whiskey distilling setup. Given that gin's being seen as the next big thing in the spirits industry, the idea that gin makers are looking to diversify might be one of those canary in the coal mine warning signs, or it could just be a really good idea. That's Whiskey Cast in depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies. Comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The what I'm tasting this week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit, and since the holiday season is here. Let's start with the Whiskey Exchange's annual Christmas release. The 2019 edition of A Fine Christmas Malt is a 10-year-old Linkwood bottled at 54.2% ABV. The nose has a good balance of vanilla, lemon zest, roasted almonds, a leather jacket, and a slight touch of mint in the background. The taste is malty with a good burst of cinnamon spice that fades to reveal hints of toffee and lemon zest at first, but then it changes to show a slightly herbal character with a touch of chocolate-covered cherries. Adding some water keeps the spices alive just a bit longer, while the finish is long and slightly tart with hints of garden herbs, chocolate, and almonds. I'm scoring the Whiskey Exchanges a fine Christmas malt, a 94. Two weeks ago, we heard from Daft Mill's Francis Cuthbert on Whiskey Cast in Depth. And while I was in Canada last weekend, the Whiskey Ferry delivered a sample of Daft Mill's first U.S. bottling, the 2006 Summer Batch Release. This 12-year-old single malt comes from seven First Fill X bourbon casks, and it's bottled at 46% ABV. The nose is fruity and vibrant, with notes of peaches, orange marmalade, honey, and a touch of toasted coconut. The taste is tart and fruity with lemon pepper, orange marmalade, honey, and touches of coconut and almonds that combine for a thick and luscious mouthfeel. The finish is long and sweet with lingering touches of honey, peaches, lemon zest, and just a hint of oak. It's an outstanding whiskey, and I'm scoring the Daft Mill 2006 Summer Batch Release for the U.S. a 95. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey, celebrating the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit sagamorespirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. Now, let's look at a couple of whiskeys with tie-ins to the media world of sorts. Royal Mile Whiskies has the official single malt for the Amber Light, the new Scotch whiskey documentary starring Dave Broom. And Dave picked a 17-year-old Ben Nevis single cask from Thompson Brothers. It's a refill ex-sherry cask bottled at 52.2% ABV. 
and it has a lot of that old-school character that we don't see much anymore. The nose has notes of ripe fruits, honey, and a touch of nuttiness with a slightly earthy character. The taste is syrupy thick with a good balance of peach nectar, mango, papaya, barley sugar, and a subtle touch of spices. The finish is long, earthy, mouth-coating, and thick. It's a solid throwback to single malts of the past, and I'm scoring the Amberlite 17-year-old Ben Nevis cask a 94. Last month, we reported that the three drinkers, Helen and Nicklin, Colin Hampton White, and A.D. Smith, had bottled a 17-year-old blended malt to go along with the second season of their Amazon Prime series, which premieres this month. The three drinkers, cask selection number one, is available exclusively through Master of Malt, and I received a sample of it the other day. It's bottled at 45% ABV, and the nose has notes of caramel candy, oak tannins, black cherries, toffee, dark chocolate, and a slightly dusty character with a hint of old books. The spices build up slowly on the palate and reach a good peak with white pepper, allspice, and cardamom notes, along with a hint of Christmas cake in the background and a touch of black cherries that develops late and lasts through the finish. I'm scoring the three drinkers, cask selection number one, a 91. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,700 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. Everyone knows the expression, "'Tis better to give than to receive." At Redbreast, we don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Maybe it's better to give Redbreast and receive. Like receiving a glass or two right away for your thoughtful gift of Ireland's definitive single pot still whiskey. Or receiving that, hey, thanks again for that bottle of red breast, a month later. Or receiving that shout out in a wedding speech for introducing the groom to red breast, completely overlooking the fact that you introduced him to his bride as well. What we're trying to say is, introducing someone to red breast will come back to you in unexpected ways. Red breast, you've landed on something special. Now be sure to share it. Proud sponsor of Whiskeycast. Time to announce our Whiskey Club of the Month winner for December. This month, we're picking the Single Malt Society of Madison, Wisconsin. Longtime listener Scott Rogers nominated his club, which has monthly tastings and welcomes potential new members for a free initial meeting. They're also planning a Burns Supper next month, complete with homemade haggis and club members on the bagpipes. We've added a link to their Facebook page on the Whiskey Club's page at WhiskeyCast.com, and we'll be sending them two dozen WhiskeyCast Glencairn glasses to use at their tastings. Now, if you're a member of a Whiskey Club, all you have to do to be in the running for Whiskey Club of the Month honors is to use the contact form at WhiskeyCast.com and get in touch with us. Tell us a bit about your club, and if you have a website or a social media presence, We'll be glad to add a link on the Whiskey Clubs page at our website. Now, you only have to enter one time. We carry over entries from month to month, and we'll announce the next winner on January's first episode of Whiskey Cast. Once again, congratulations to the Single Malt Society of Madison, Wisconsin, our December Whiskey Club of the Month. And thanks to our friends at Glencairn Crystal for their support. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. Thanksgiving Day was Thursday in the U.S., and it's a chance to share the things that we are grateful for. Of course, here at WhiskeyCast, we are grateful for each and every one of you. But our friends at Redbreast gave us a chance to show that gratitude. They sent over some of their Redbreast caps. Now, they're called toques in Canada, Beanies in a lot of places, and here in the U.S., we'd call them stocking caps. So this week, we asked those of you who follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn to tell us what you're grateful for this Thanksgiving, and we'll pick five listeners at random to receive a red breast cap. 
There were a lot of answers, nearly 200 in all, and I have to admit that many of them seemed to make the room a little dustier. Or at least that's how my eyes felt. For instance, Joe Lawson posted this from the UK on our Facebook page. Being here to enjoy life with my friends and family after almost dying during the birth of my first and only child. Joe, as I said on Facebook, we are so glad both you and your baby are doing well now. From Aaron Pros on Instagram, I'm grateful that my youngest is fully recovered from a brain injury she had as an infant. The doctors are even saying she is advanced now. Slotcha. Aaron, that's great news to hear. From Whiskey Lovers Argentina on Instagram, I am grateful for my newborn daughter. I changed my life in a positive sense. Cheers. Mike Joachim tweeted this, Thankful to have made a big career path change this year. Best thing that's happened to me. And I'm not going to share this woman's name, but I did want to share her tweet with you. I'm thankful my daughter is getting help, that help was available, and she loves rather than hates me for having to let go. Even though I miss her terribly this holiday, I am grateful she is safe. We are hoping for the best for your daughter, you, and your whole family. Now, Jeff Adams at Rummer DC tweeted this, I'm thankful for my grandma. Today was her 101st Thanksgiving, and I was able to have lunch with her. I'm also thankful for finding Irish whiskey. My journey has been short, but it has consumed so much time and money already, including two great trips to Ireland. And Fiona Shoup tweeted this from the UK. It's not been an easy year health-wise, but I'm thankful to be alive and for great whiskey, which helps me to keep going. Happy Thanksgiving. Fiona, we hope the coming year is a better one for you health-wise. Alan Jessup Peacock posted this on our Facebook page. I'm grateful that Danielle Cole agreed to marry me when I proposed to her a few weeks ago, and I'm incredibly thankful to have that amazing woman in my life. Congratulations to both of you. But I have to admit that when I mentioned to Alan that if he won one of those red breast caps, we were going to expect him to wear it at the wedding. Danielle replied, Definitely not. I'd turn back the other way, with double hysterically laughing emojis. We had a few others on the lighter side, like this response from Joe Terranova on LinkedIn. I am grateful for every tree in the United States that is turned into a bourbon barrel, because I know how much more each one gives the world after one use. And we had this tweet from Canada. Once again, I'm not going to share the listener's name. I am thankful my boss is going back to the U.S. for Thanksgiving. That must be a fun place to work. And finally, we had this one from Soren in the U.K., at OCD Whiskey on Twitter, I'm thankful to wake up each morning, and as utterly fantastic as that hat is, if I win, please find a homeless person and gift it to them. Well, I wish we could give everyone a red breast cap, but here are the five winners that we picked at random Jeff Kruger, Greg Taylor, Charles Crawford, Carol O'Connell, and Dennis Hendricks. And, Soren, for your generosity, we're also going to send you a red breast cap, and we're also going to gift one to a homeless person who needs it to keep warm. Once again, thanks to everyone who shared their thoughts of gratitude with us, and once again, we're grateful to be able to bring you Whiskey Cast each week. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at WhiskeyCast. Or you can just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that all combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. We have gotten a lot of whiskey questions recently, 
For instance, this one from Daniel Brown in Taipei, Taiwan. I've seen pictures and heard from some friends who've worked in distilleries that new make will sometimes come off the still an odd blue color. It reportedly returns to a clear color after some time. I imagine this is a result of copper, but I'd be glad to have a proper explanation if possible. Well, Daniel, you're right in that copper is part of the cause, but there's more to it than that. I took the question to Lisa Wicker, the master distiller at Widow Jane, and the consulting distiller for George Washington's Distillery at Mount Vernon. Um, that's not good. There's copper in it. Probably there's something sloughing off inside the still. Um, I've seen it before. Generally, it means there's some still maintenance that needs to be done. How would something like that happen? Just crud gets up in there, stuff uh, condenses on the inside of the copper or what? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. You know, it, it sloughs off like anything else. That's the reason, especially like with even these historic stills at Mount Vernon, you know, the Shermans will come out and inspect them to make sure that they're still sound because you're losing a little bit of copper, right? It's, you know, it's a soft metal. It's sloughing off. And, you know, especially like on welds, um, it naturally comes out of the still. Now, Lisa hinted that it's probably a maintenance issue, and since Mike Sherman of Vendome Still and Copper Works was a few tables over, I asked him to explain how to correct the problem. They got to do a cleaning on their copper still and wash all that down and out, rejuvenate the copper, and then that will clean that up. There's a chemical reaction up there in that copper, but you got to have that that clean copper to do what it's supposed to do, which is keep your sulfurs and sulfates back in the still and not come over in your distillate. So if you don't clean the copper with a caustic wash and, and rejuvenate the copper, then you'll probably have some quality issues. Daniel, I hope that answers your question. Now, we had Francis Cuthbert of Daft Mill on the show a couple of weeks ago, and we used a photo of a row of Daft Mill's barrels in front of a warehouse on the WhiskeyCast website, along with that podcast. The barrel heads were all painted white with black stenciling. And that led us to this question from Cheney Uffelman in Virginia at C. Uffelman on Twitter. What kind of paint do they use on the barrels? I've never had that question before, so I emailed Francis Cuthbert to ask, and here's what he said. The honest answer is whatever I have to hand, but I think it's a water-based emulsion paint. As long as it covers up the previous stencil marks, the first fill casks are stenciled onto the bare wood, so it is only the refill casks that are painted here. And that leads us to another question. Why do some distilleries use different colors of paint on their barrel heads? While barrels today are almost always marked with barcodes that give the specific details on each barrel, painting the heads gives the distillery and warehouse crews an easy way to tell just how many times a barrel has been used. For instance, a lot of distilleries will do like Daft Mill does and just stencil their first fill barrels on bare wood, while refill barrels may get a coat of white paint on the head and a different color of paint for a second fill barrel. If they get older barrels rejuvenated at a cooperage, those barrels would get a third color that stands out from the rest. But... Each whiskey maker has its own policy on painting barrel heads. Remember, bourbon barrels all start out at another distillery in the U.S. before they wind up in Scotland or other places. Some distilleries will paint the heads just to cover up somebody else's brand, especially if those barrels are going into a warehouse that might be part of public tours. Cheney, thanks for asking the question. I always figured they used whatever paint was on sale at the local hardware store. And finally, Stuart Staples in Bychester, England, sent this note the other day. Congratulations on the 14th anniversary. Love the show. It's one of the highlights on my podcast week. I have recommended it to all my whiskey drinking friends. I recently did a whiskey distillery tour and have a question. As we looked in the washbacks at the fermentation process, in one of the washbacks was a knob of butter. The guide confirmed it was a knob of butter, But with taking everything in on the tour, I forgot to ask the guide why they added a knob of butter. I don't ever remember reading that butter is a whiskey ingredient, but surely it must add something. It must also make whiskey non-vegan as an animal-derived ingredient. 
Is this normal? Is butter widely used in the fermentation process? Well, this is another question I'd never seen before, but I suspected that it might have something to do with keeping the bubbles that occur during fermentation under control. Stewart told me in a second email that his tour was at the Cotswolds Distillery in England, so I checked in with founder Daniel Zor to get an explanation, and here's what he said in his email. Your spot on re the butter. We drop a pad into each washback in order to minimize foaming, just as lots of our country neighbors do when they make homemade jam in order to keep the pot from boiling over. This came as a suggestion from our mentor, the late great Dr. Jim Swan, as an alternative to the silicone anti-foam used by some folks, but which Jim begged us not to use, warning that silicone clogs the pores of the still and decreases copper contact over time. Not having enough money to retrofit motorized switchers onto our eight washbacks, we found this to be a great and novel craft alternative. As to whether it impacts any sort of vegan, kosher, etc. credentials, I can't say. I can, however, categorically tell you that it is our understanding that no butter comes over during distillation. Hope that helps. Daniel, thanks for helping us answer that one. And I should note that this technique might not fly in Scotland, but since distilleries in England aren't subject to the Scotch whiskey law of 2009, it's perfectly legal. It probably means the Cotswold single malts aren't completely vegan, and they may not be completely kosher. But then again, I'm not a rabbi, nor am I a vegan. Thanks for all of your questions, and if you have something you'd like us to look at on a future episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com, along with links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, the calendar of events, cocktail recipes, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. You can always use the contact form at whiskeycast.com. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And you can always email us. The address, comments at whiskeycast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing. Pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.